Hi, and welcome back to By the Fire podcast, where I, Ken, your host, take you through mythical tales and creatures from across the Black Diaspora. So today I had the honour of being able to interview Gift, who was the founder of OK London, a jewellery brand. Now, she's from the ethnic group Orobo, which is in southern Nigeria, and in this episode we are able to discuss mythology from that area, and also what her jewellery brand means to her, and what it means to the people of Nigeria. I hope you enjoy! So hi Giff, thank you for joining me today. It was really great like having you here and I really hope everyone who listens feels the same way. So the first thing I want to hi. ask, <laughs> hi. So the first thing I want to ask is, you know, who who are you and you know what do you do? So yeah, hi, my name's Gift. Um, God's gift as my mum wanted um my name to represent. So hi. Um I am a producer and I like to call myself a cultural curator because I feel like as a black woman. A lot of things that black women naturally do, do create culture. We create pop culture, we create culture and the next trend. So I ask myself a culture curator in terms of what I do because I like curate like events, young people's programming. Um, but I also just feel like as a black woman, I like walk. I'm a walking curator of things. Mm. So I like it's like a self title. I don't see why I can't do that. So I've, that's what I decided to do. <laughs> um, I'm queer, autistic, ADHD. So in terms of your ethnicity, can you tell everyone like you know where you're from? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Identify as? Oh, it's a real melting pot, as most Nigerians can, um, may, can maybe experience. Yeah. So I like to say I'm the Yoruba woman because it's kind of culturally, it's kind of turns things on its head. So usually if you're Nigerian, you'll take the identity or the ethnic group of your, of your dad. So my dad is half Yoruba. So even my dad's side is, <laughs> is still mixed. So my dad's half Yoruba, half Benin. Um, and my mum is Yoruba and is Shekiri, so they're both like smaller ethnic groups yeah. in southern Nigeria. Um, but the Yoruba people um, are like where she, she grew up more, more around Yoruba people, um, but she speaks like Shekiri and Yoruba as well. Um, and I kind of this as a Yoruba woman because um, my mum kind of always has described herself as one. Yeah. Um, as I learn more about Yoruba people and all things, I feel like I definitely identify with a lot of the things and ways of living and like especially at the closest with water and things like that it's been mm. really special um especially because I, I spent a lot of my time fearing water as well um so yeah so I did find a normal woman but because I because most of the time to be honest people don't know who the Uruble people are they've never heard of it so me saying I'm an horrible shekiri they'll still get the same look of confusion anyways <laughs> I just lead with that basically yeah I can relate because me too my dad is from is Buki and I'm on the bus river so and the language is Bembe. So if you don't know, mm. it's, it's very small. It's like dying out, which is a shame. So you mentioned mm. Oroba. So um, what was that thing you're talking about, how there's a special relationship with the water? So, to, I mean, the connection with water is something that I've been learning as I've been reading. So there's not a lot of accessible Oroba um, information out there. I've had to do a lot of digging to find out. Okay. And knowing and understanding like that they that um, a lot of rural people live near the river and Shakuri people as well. So they're in the same area similar area actually um they're near water a lot of traditional religion and um practices involve the water has been a real life changer for me because my mom is a very strong christian so she doesn't actually engage in any of that traditional religion or practices mm. but she, well, she, she, doesn't, she doesn't say that she does but i think when i now that i've been learning about traditional practices and religions and actually learning about i guess what the christian version of that would look like yeah. she actually does some of those rituals and things but the, the but rather than say like she just says organe which means god in a robot so she still says the right names yes. i guess <laughs> but basically she just changes the names of things with with names of things from christianity um okay. the way she like practices her faith a lot does come from have has roots in the way that rural people traditionally practice it, mm. practice their religion so basically yeah <laughs> no, that's, that's so interesting well now i'm to move on to OK london and that is your brand that's your business it looks really great so i'd Thank like you. to ask you first of all what inspired you to start that brand so um uh, a lot of um horrible uh, languages because different dialects depending on where you live in horrible land which is now you know the delta state um the words are very tonal so when I was doing research, I was trying to find out different things about the Yoruba language and like translations of stuff. I was told that Oke uh, pronounced a certain way means gift or like a, a gift from God or like okay. great, like used in conjunction with like certain things can mean gift or it can mean time. And I really liked that. And I wanted to name the brand after me, but I didn't want it to be 
called actually just a gift because it felt mm. a bit easy. Sorry, I should swear. <laughs> it felt a bit like oh, it, didn't, it didn't feel right to me. I was like, it's okay. something else, a bit more whatever. Um, and so I went with this one because it was named after me. I like the aspect of time because the timing of this just felt so right. Mm. Um, and it was also named after me because it, it, it's a I the, the jewelry brand is is like a visual representation of the journey I'm on and the learning. Like as each new collection or each new piece that I design or think about and create, I can like see from where where I was to where, like what is now, like the journey I've been on as I learn and as I have my own creative voice, what that looks like. And that's, that's really exciting. Yeah, I love that as well. And like with your designs, they are so intricate and they look really cool. And even the names, is that part of that language as well? Because I can see, again, if I'm saying this wrong, please at me, but it's Mm -hmm. Asi Isio and Oyivui. Yes, so Yivri means boldness because um, I was really inspired by the, um, when I was looking through archive pictures of rural women, like going to like parties, going to the club, things like that, mm. just like these old images that when I was researching online, they all were just going, so, I mean, like there was no one that was just dressing somehow, they all looked like they like planned the yes. their outfits, you know? Um, and that was really inspiring because I was like, they're turning up, they're ready to come, they're ready to take up space. And it was really inspiring to see that. And so I was like, how can I do this, but in a like cute, like chic way in terms of like, this is, is going to look like a really nice classy earring, but it's also going to grab your attention and be like, oh, actually that's not what I thought it was. And that's what exactly what I was to embold um, and create with these earrings, I should say. So that's why I named it Boldness because I feel like you step into an event, you're like, and like oh, that's a classy, but oh, actually, oh, that's, I see what you've done there. <laughs> that's exactly the reaction I want for people. Um, and Isio, I mean, star in Urubu, so it means, so I, I, it was like inspired by the fact that in certain parts of the worry and in like rural parts of Urubu land, you can you can see the stars at night. Um, okay. And someone I was talking to in Urubu, in, 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 um, in Delta State was like, sent me pictures of what it looks like at night, which is really, really awesome. And also in, in worry, like at nighttime, the city lights are just beautiful. I thought, I love city lights. I think that's, I think it's really awesome. So this, this was like inspired by that. That's so nice. So have you been like lately? No, please. I wish coronavirus said no. <laughs> but I really, 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 really want to go. So this has all been a lot of okay is and I wanna try and make something more of, of something, but I don't know if they want me to shout them. But a lot of um my research and things I've learned have just been from like joining Rubble um, Facebook groups and mm. being connected with different people, just telling telling us people I'm doing this. And they're like, I know this rural person, I'll introduce them. I'm like, yes, please, anybody. And and then I'm just asking them questions and me and them sending me pictures, voice notes, me, them introducing me to their auntie from somewhere, all these things. I've been kind of collating information mm. that way. And I feel like I've learned so much more in that collation of information than like anything I could have searched for online. And that's what's been like helping me drive the brand and like create the stuff I want to create for sure. And that's how it was in the past. Like it was very much oral, you know, things weren't being written down necessarily. So I definitely exactly. need to do the same. I definitely have plans to just reach out to people, learn mm. my Membe language, because again, mm. similar with me, there's not really much out there. Um, yeah. There's like one PDF dictionary, but yes, you know, oh that, that one God. by um, an English writer for some reason. And again, I'm just like, um, this ain't it. <laughs> yeah so I really like appreciate how you would like reach out to people and people would also be engaging with you as well it shows that there is that sense of community still mm-hmm. even if you're like so so far away from home which is amazing yeah no it's, it's it's really like it's just been really special and people have been so forthcoming and so helpful and I think people are also really keen like I think one thing people like is curiosity like I think a lot of especially the elders are like really like happy that I'm curious because a lot maybe I sometimes hear that some their children aren't really interested in that mm. kind of stuff. I guess because they're living and breathing it every day, they, they kind of almost take it for granted potentially. Exactly. But like me, that in, in London, I start trying to pronounce the, the tonality things of that. I'm just like struggling. I'm like, please, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm curious and I just want to eat everything up. So yeah. Really cool. Exactly. That's so cool. Okay. So what I wanted to know then is the jewelry that you've designed then. So who produces that and where is that produced? Yeah. So it is by, made by um, freelance um, artisans based in Kenya. So I work with a B-Cert 
B Corp certified manufacturer based there who kind of hire them as independent contractors. Um, and what this means is that they can stay close to home rather than having to like, travel into a big city um, and then do work and then commute back. They can actually stay closer to home with their families and in their communities, which means they can kind of be part of it and kind of work with their own schedule rather than capitalism schedule, which is quite mm. nice. Um, so <laughs> the jewelry actually takes about, because handmade as well, takes about four to six weeks or something. Four to six weeks, sometimes four to eight weeks to be made and shipped. And that's in small batches of about 50 um, pieces, um, 50 of each piece, basically. Okay. Um, I don't, I, I'm not making thousands here because it's, it's handmade. That would be impossible. No, for sure. time scale. So there's a lot of things that go into it there. Um, my dream is for it to be made in Nigeria. And my like biggest dream, obviously, would be for it to be made in a rural land, supporting the local community um, and then putting money into the local economy. Because right now, a lot of most of the money for that um, and the jobs come from big oil companies. Um, okay. and so I'd like to just offer something else. Yeah. something creative something in um, something where people are hopefully paid a, a livable wage it's not hopeful they will be paid a livable yeah. wage <laughs> more than livable hopefully um and something that gives people the flexibility uh and hopefully maybe ambition to that want to see beyond and uh, potentially the opportunities that have been laid out to them previously if that makes sense yeah no, that sounds really, really good and apart from like that ambition do you have any other goals for the brand in general yeah, um, I hope I continue to um, be as viciously <laughs> certain about what I want. So right now we're a slow fashion brand, which means that because it takes four six weeks for it to be made, and because I'm working and surviving as a as a you know a, a young black working class girl in Southeast London, like mm. things are slow. We're not going to be released in like. 10 things at once great. with a uh, way yeah I love slow anyway so yeah <laughs> thank you um and like, all these things and I think I sometimes there's been opportunities that I've like put myself forward for they're like yeah we don't really have a range and like our, our like our, 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 our like maybe customer base or our, our, our audience would want to see a range of things I'm like I completely understand that mm. but I and I feel often dejected when I see those messages so I'm like like oh, I know, but this one thing that we do have is really good. I can guarantee yeah. the one thing we have is good. Rather than, I'm going to give you 10 subpar, the one thing we have is really good, trust me. Exactly. <laughs> it's how I feel, but I'm, I'm happy that I'm fierce in my beliefs. And I will continue to be, to be honest, but I hope I continue forever to be as fierce in, in my anti-capitalist beliefs, in my slow fashion beliefs, and in my beliefs that it's what it's always quality over quantity every single time. So now I'm going to move on to Honourable Folklore, since, you know, it's yeah. a Spotify podcast. So, you know, we've been doing a bit of research. We found a few really interesting creatures, didn't we? Yes, we did. <laughs> so, you know what? When I was reading what you found about the Aziza, let's start with yeah. them. So I knew them to be quite benevolent, um, really nice, it's a bit, essentially like really nice, like wood fairies. Um, you know, they helped humans um, teach them how to hunt, teach them, taught them how to, um, you know, use wood to make fire. They, they were very much like friends with humans until humans decided to sort of take advantage, which, you know, that does that sounds like humans. And yeah. s- since then, they, they were more shy because they just said, OK, let's just, you know, pull back. So they're very much like benevolent, very much like in in the woods they just hide yeah. they're not bad but then what did you find <laughs> do you know what's funny when i when i was like mom what's this these are the way she like whips her head around to she's like pardon pardon <laughs> i was like what so I, she's like why are you knowing these things why are you looking oh into God. these things I, was like, I don't know i'm just curious <laughs> and she's like it's very very evil so obviously from her perspective, and yep. for some people in the land, um, Aziza can be seen as an evil creature, kind of almost like a goblin. Right. Some people say that you, they can't even be seen with the physical eye. Um, you know, some people would say that if you, if you see Aziza, that's not a good sign of things to come. Um, and basically, she is associated with, um, can be associated with all things black, so like nighttime, mm. or even just like a really dark room that you kind of don't really want to go in alone. Like she, she, she could be there. So she's not necessarily some people limited to the forest, but she is limited, from what I understand, to the darkness. Um, and so that's why and apparently some there's no hunters that are horrible would ever that would ever take like a black dog with them to go hunting, because wow. if she kind of can associate and kind of assume into anything black 
that she could obviously assume the spirit or become this dog that is working yeah. with them. And obviously the dog could then turn on the owner or the dog could like, you know, not be a helpful hunting. The dog could do all sorts of things. So there's not a lot of rural men that do hunting that would go for black dog because of his disease, which I think is really interesting. Um, but I mean, from what I understand, she, or they, I, I think she's a she, because she has like a real badass, like <laughs> tough, like nice switch. Like she has to switch it up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> She's kind of a, uh, considered a swift, agile hunter and, you know, is um, deemed tall and quite, not a dominating presence, but a known presence. Okay. So it can, I know in some, in some folklore, there are, there can be kind of deities that kind of feel like they took up a lot of space and they're going to come and like engulf you. And I don't think that's what Aziza is about. It's kind of this, it's a figure that you kind of not sure you're seeing. Mm-hmm. But if you identify that you've seen it, you know, you need to, Need to get the fuck out of Basically, need to go. That's so in- that's so interesting. Because, like, like I said, the what I found from her was like she, she's tiny, mm. um, she's hairy, but she's as small as a um, like butterfly. She mm. normally lives in like ant hills or like silk cotton trees, which I've mentioned in previous episodes. That tree is associated with spirits. Like there are so many spirits that live in that cotton tree, and yeah. they're normally like. Those trees are actually normally spoken about in Caribbean folklore, but I think obviously that must have originated from West Africa. So mm. for her to be living there as well, like apparently, you know, she's actually really wise as well. She shares the wisdom of um, herbs and plants and teaches about survival as well. So this mm. other depiction is like there are some similarities. Yeah, but I again, it's, yeah. it's I think also it's about who is like who comes up who comes across as these are so i think a lot of the the like the tales of horror come from people that maybe see them in the um see them at night time mm. or um see them or do things like this please um as these are different things like that and so maybe the people that see the good side of them is maybe during the daytime or they're not doing things that displease them so i don't know i just i find with folklore and with deities um because they like live with the land and because most of them are just created to harm. Yeah. Um, they, 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 serve, they serve a purpose and they, you know, they're definitely realms that connect um, the world that we see and the world that we don't. I, I, I feel like basically the form in which you see them says a lot about your current situation, yes. maybe things that you've recently done mm-hmm. um, or things that maybe you intend to do. Even the, the environment being the forest, the forest is so different during the day compared yes. to night. Like, like... Yes pun the pun in terms of day and night but it is literally like the forest being in the forest whilst the sun is out very nice you know mystical but then at night yeah. it's very much like okay you don't want to be here so I think that does like also um show in like the different depictions of of these user as well 100 and I wouldn't be surprised if in a way, it, Aziza's job is to protect this the forest and nature. Yeah. You know, you have to you have to create something scary mm-hmm. and off-putting to protect nature because there's also things in nature that people want. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if, if Aziza was in a way there to to you know appeal and be a, a friendly face to people that are treating nature in a kind way. And but but also in the nighttime, people that maybe don't have those those like kind of good and positive intentions. Um, can be there to protect it and so people that maybe come across them in, in the nighttime might not come across the nicer version because they're there doing their doing their job I guess or their purpose or they're serving with exactly no again I love that because a lot of these stories are about you know teaching morals and mm. even with the more benevolent Aziza there is still that element in the story which is like humans took advantage yeah and therefore you know Instead of in my from my story from what I know, instead of um, them being like antagonists, they sort of just b- withdrew, mm. from humans, and therefore humans could have learned more, but we didn't yeah. because we chose to just be overpowering. So yeah. again, there's just that that moral to a story, which is like, look, you're supposed to be working with people, work with them so you can improve yourself as you know hunters, as herbalists, yeah. instead mm. of them taking advantage. Oh, I love, I love, I love. Oh, it's one of my favorite topics ever. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for creating the space to talk about it. It's, it's amazing. No, of course. But let's move on to, I, mean, I hope I'm saying this right. Oh, ho, ho. Oh, ho, ho. It's, uh, oh, whoa, whoa. 
Oh, cool. I think there we go. I don't know who this is. Do you want to tell everyone who this is? Yes. So, um, <laughs> Owaru is said to have originated in the waters of South, De- uh, South Delta, rubber land, um, amongst the villages of uh, Ijo. So, it's a, it's a story, a magical tale. Mm-hmm. And a story I found really interesting. So, uh, the commonly told story involves a man who travels to a fishing grounds in the uh, south of, of the rubber land and stays there for many years. His wife resists the pressures from family. Um, resist the pressures from the family members to give him up for dead. So he goes and ha- obviously he's hiding in the South um, and his family members are like, you know, people are pressuring his family saying like, we know he's hiding there, give him up. And they're like, no, please. Um, but he does ultimately return. And when he returns to the place that was demanding him to be there, because apparently he was seen as like a thief. Or, mm. um, he said that he met a war route and, and so as a result, he brought back art, music and dance for all to enjoy. And basically this man returning after Ken, basically he was exiled, bringing back these things and this message from, from, this, from this water god um, is then celebrated uh, yearly as a festival. Mm. And this festival is performed by men, by men and, is held, and is held in honour of the faithful women in the town because obviously his women, the women and his, uh, his wife and family didn't give, want to give him up to, mm. to the people that want him, wanted him dead, basically. That's really interesting. Yeah, I, I never knew about this, um, like, God is water spirit as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I know you mentioned earlier about the relationship between, like, um, horrible people and water because, you know, the location. What is, like, what is, like, a, a world's, like, um, involvement in, you know, day-to-day activities? Like, do people pray to him? Or um, I know that it's festival, but is there more yeah. than that? So I think... I believe, and that I might be wrong, that people of the um, Ukbe religion mm. pray to him and like celebrate it during this festival. Yeah. Um, because basically the abundance of water, clean water, and the celebration of like the f- keeping the water healthy for like the fish to be there so they can fish the fish to eat it and things like that uh, are the reason that they like pray to him and like you know um potentially makes up some of them make sacrifices um but also just basically celebrate and respect the water that they buy water because basically the water is the reason that they're alive they drink from the of water course. they eat from the water they bath from the water and so keeping it as a place that is clean and respected is really really important because there's also an annual fishing festival that goes along with them with mm. the celebration of a waru so um yeah it's just it's just again it's it's i think when i hear stuff people talk about sustainability and the environment i just think a lot of African, West African practices and a lot of um, indigenous, indigenous. around the world's yeah. practices yeah. really are about respecting the earth because it gives so much mm-hmm. and the forms in which it takes, you know, maybe spiritual, but the net result is the same. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So, and I think if, and I, re- I recently saw this article by this, um, this, com- this man that owns this company that sell, that makes these like um, portable, stoves okay. and they were basically trying to say that if if like rural west africans stopped using the traditional um gasoline fire stoves to cook their food uh then like the environment and the like local and like the environment basically would be in a better state mm. and i was like don't you fucking dare you're trying to okay. tell me so you know tolu making his his him and his family exactly. eat the fish for dinner is the reason the environment is the way it is not you and your company spilling oil into the ocean. Exactly. Do you know what I mean? I was like, don't you dare. And when I see stuff like this, I'm like, there is no way the people that are living by these places are respecting the water and taking care of it and are celebrating the fact that there's abundance of water every yeah. year are the reason the things are the way they are. There's just no way. It, it's so interesting. I think it's like pre industrialization a lot of the practices are still happening in certain rural areas in West Africa and other indigenous mm. places. Like I'm thinking of Native Americans, but I'll mm. focus on West Africans and in Nigeria. Just the uh, I spoke in a previous episode about how there is this relationship between what we how we treat the natural world and how that translates in the spiritual world. So there's this whole idea that you know how we treat the world here like I said, translates there. Therefore, we should treat the world here with respect and it will ha- respect will be brought back to us in the spiritual world. And the just the whole idea of, you know, make, being sustainable, not fishing 
not overfishing because there is an issue with overfishing in the UK, but let me not talk too much. But mm. having a healthy relationship with the fish in terms of like having a balance, yeah. I'm so glad that that happens in Orable and in other places that rely on the waters. Well, when you th- I, I think like I, most like Western African cultures and villages and things like that, it's about live, in, living in harmony with nature. Yeah. Because that like, you can't, I'm not being funny, you can't just go to your local Tesco and buy some food. Do you know what I mean? Like you no. have to, you, you, you are like thinking strategically about how to make the most of what is available locally. Mm-hmm. You're not eating bigger than your eyes. You're trying to like, just eat enough for your family and you're yeah. like you wanted to share there's a sense of community as well wanted to share to care of each other that I think also plays a part in the way the world is now because basically like thinking when you're eating your meal you're well for some people anyway, when you're eating your dinner you're not thinking about whether your neighbor has eaten mm-hmm. or whether they would like some of your dinner that's yeah. just not something you do but like you know or even eating, who made like, the food people, even like what was the labor involved in making this meal exactly anyway i hope i told that story correctly i mean it's one situations where like there again it's an oral story so there's mm. so many versions of it you know some people say that basically um the, the the man that traveled to the fishing grounds um he went he went there and stayed in this fishing ground for years and no one understood why and the reason his wife was his wife was uh, um was being asked to give him up for dead is because his family was like, so this guy married you and just fuck off now, bring him back. Let's mm. let's deal with him. Do you know what I mean? And she was like, no, no, no. Like, I, you know, I don't believe he's like done something like this. It's, a, it's been a good, like she just, she like, you know, she just believed in whatever he was doing. And maybe she explained, maybe he explained to her and said, hey, don't, look, I'm just talking to Oru. Don't worry about it, hon. I'll be back in a couple of years. And she understood and other people didn't, you know, I don't know. Um, and so when he came back and he said he met Oru and brought back and brought the back. Yeah. Um, uh, and then, and, and that would also make sense as to why the festival was held in honor of faithful women because she was she believed uh, in whatever he went to that uh, yeah. fishing grounds in, in, in the south of R- 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 land to do and was greatly awarded with it and yeah. like, let's celebrate that belief um and that waiting i mean I, i'm not telling anyone to wait for some wait for their man who disappears for four years or whatever mm-hmm. but uh <laughs> do you know but what i, I mean think, i think yeah. there's, there's different origins as to why the man ended up there what pulled him there why he was there for so long you know, things like that. So, um, if I'm not telling it correctly, or you, or you've had a different version, like please tell me. I, I'm so open to hearing it because, yeah, no. like I said, this is just what Google has to offer me. I'm still learning from so many different people, and also, colonialism has killed a lot of these stories. And so, mm. when I sometimes ask these aunts and uncles, like they don't know, but they're like, "Oh, my grandma probably knows." I'm like, "My grandma's, I don't know, like, is she still alive though." Like, do you know what I mean? So. It is sometimes a bit hard to find the true oral history of them, which is why I want to go to Nigeria, find any old person I can talk to, and really yeah. just try and at least get on a, on a video, um, a voice note, some of this, some of these stories, so we can at least te- put them on text, so we can have at least the most up to date version that they yeah. can put down somewhere. That's really great to hear. Finally, then, where can people find you, your brand, your website, your business? Um, yeah. Just a website? Yes, yeah, so our website is okay-london, so okay-london.com. Um, they can also find us Instagram and Twitter, so okay underscore London on all those platforms. And also feel free to sign up for our mailing list, which you can do so on our website. But also like at me. So my handle is at Gifty Love across all the platforms. So happy it's finally across all platforms is the same. Uh-huh. That really irritated me. <laughs> If you if you have an auntie or uncle that wants to talk to me, your mom, your grandma, if you want to talk to me about stuff that you've heard, um, please do reach out. I'm constantly trying to connect with fellow horrible people. I love when people DM me saying, hey, I'm horrible. So I'm like, yeah, you found me. I don't know how you found me, but I'm so glad you're here. Yes. Or when people are like, I've never seen something dedicated to horrible people before. Because I remember when I first started the brand and uh, the page um, Eurobiasm shouted us out. Mm. Um, we've got we've got quite a few followers from that saying finally I've never seen the robot version of like this kind of thing because other oh. robot people are very proud and vocal about their history and heritage yeah. but like when it comes to small ethnic groups there's nothing like visibly out there that people can follow and learn from so I was really pleased to get those kind of messages because I was like this is exactly why I started the brand because although it's a jewelry brand I want it to be like a platform for like the robot community in terms of they know that there's someone out there that is trying to do the research that cares um, that can connect them with other people if they so wish. 
Um, and that's also creating stuff inspired by the beautiful cultural heritage and history that is there and that people, more people need to know about, basically. No, that's amazing. Like, thank you for coming on. I was really grateful hearing from you. And you've also inspired me to just be more proactive in finding my Bembe people, my Boki people. Yes! Also, if you guys are out there, please, it's the same thing, like, holler at me as well, because I'm trying to find my community in the UK as well. Awesome. But thank you so much again. All right. No worries. I'm so glad to be part of it. Thank you for listening to this episode. I really hope you enjoyed it. It was a great time interviewing Gift and talking about the work she does with OK London and more about her ethnic group and the mythology from that group. I would really, like, I was serious when I said I would really love to talk to um, people from different from different ethnic groups across the black diaspora hearing more about their mythology because i'm actually currently researching and i'm reading about you know um low-key groups that i wouldn't have known about last year so if you're someone who like me is from a smaller ethnic group then reach out i'd love to hear from you if you enjoyed this episode be sure to rate and comment on apple Podcasts and follow on spotify and you can also listen on soundcloud Use the hashtag BTFpod so we can continue the conversation online and I look forward to you joining me for the next episode. You can also follow me on bythefire underscore pod on Instagram, Twitter and TikTok and I'm also available on Facebook. If you have a creature or folklore you'd like to hear or would like to be on the guest on the show, feel free to email bythefire at bythefire.mail at gmail.com. I can't wait for you to join me for the next one. Bye!